Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Helen Heenahan, one of the, I'm delighted to say one of the surgeons because we have a new surgeon in the past few weeks. Um, uh, Naomi Fearon has joined our unit as a second bariatric surgeon and uh, we still have Mr. Gagan as, um, uh, as one of the surgeons who delivers some bariatric care across the Vincent's Hospital Group. Um, Cathy has nicely outlined how we deliver our surgical service um, with all of the pre-operative work here in Lachlanstown, but the surgical episode itself is in either Vincent's Hospital or in Michael's in Dunleary, and almost all of the post-operative care then is back out in the clinic here in Lachlanstown. Um, so over the next 25 minutes or so, I want to give you a flavour of um, what bariatric surgery is, what our services are like here in Ireland, but I want to particularly focus on complications. Um, not to burst everyone's bubble about bariatric surgery, we've heard a lot all day about how effective it is, um, and I'll touch on that, but uh, it's really important that I make you aware of the types of complications that can arise, how they can be um, treated, uh, and then give you an insight into the problem that's been posed at the minute by bariatric tourism, so the volume of work that's creating for us, and, and open up a discussion about how we might address that going forward, because I, I really think we need to do something, um, give and the risk it poses to, to the Irish population. So I will address the efficacy of surgery, the risk, and then tourism. So in case anybody isn't familiar with bariatric surgery, um, I'll give you some insight into the types of procedures that are most commonly performed. Um, most people, um, well, up until very recently, it's a unique audience with an interest in bariatric surgery. So I'm confident that most people know bariatric surgery is not gastric banding. But I often have to start talks by actually saying that, you know, when people, we read in the media or uh, stories about bariatric surgery abroad, it's always labelled just gastric banding. And I don't know about maybe a decade ago, some bands were placed here, but um, all we tend to do with bands at the moment is remove them uh, and usually as quite an urgent procedure. So we haven't placed a band certainly in the last five years that, that I've been here, partly because they're not the most successful operation in terms of benefits, um, not just weight loss, but other health benefits. Um, and secondly, they're the operation that in the long term has the highest reoperation rate. Um, so therefore the highest complication rate. So although they're safe on the day that they're placed in the theatre, um, um, and the perioperative complication rate is low, they have a, a, a quite a high long-term complication rate. Um, and the latest data with regards to um, risks of gastric banding is that uh, two-thirds of patients who have a gastric band placed will have them removed within eight years. Um, and they're removed off, most often because they haven't worked, uh, and secondly, because of complications. Um, so the most common operations we perform at the moment, and this would be um, indicative of bariatric practice worldwide would be sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass. So sleeve gastrectomy is still the most commonly performed operation. Our practice is about 55% sleeve gastrectomy, 45% uh, gastric bypass, um, which is different to the United States where sleeve gastrectomy is 80% of the volume. And that's largely because of both the simplicity and safety profile of the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, but that is balanced against uh, it, it, it um, has a slightly greater risk of weight regain in the long term and um, we try hard to get people the best intervention obviously taking safety profile into account but we try to I suppose perform gastric bypasses wherever that's safe and feasible because of its long term benefits uh, not just for weight loss but for diabetes um, improvement or remission as well there's two types of gastric, two ways you can do a gastric bypass um, you might have heard of mini bypass or one anastomosis gastric that is a one anastomosis gastric bypass there's nothing mini about a gastric by a, a mini gastric bypass. It's a full gastric bypass. It's just been labelled mini because it's one join up rather than two anastomoses. Um, and I think it's gotten um, you know when when patients present say, tell, telling you they've had a mini gastric bypass, they've essentially had all of the all, all of the gut rearrangement that's involved in a full gastric bypass. It's a term that's used a lot by patients. I've had a full bypass or a mini bypass. It's a bypass in terms of dietary intake um, requirements and vitamin requirements. Um, there is a few less complications with a mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass. We do perform it here for a select number of patients, um, but room wide gastric bypass remains the, the gold standard because of its significant improvements for um, acid reflux in particular. Um, all of these procedures are done laparoscopically. Um, uh, Cathy again mentioned the ERAS protocols that we put in place, that's enhanced recovery after surgery. So there are a number of steps we do pre-op, 
during the procedure with the anaesthetist and immediately post-op that decrease morbidity and decrease the chance of mortality. So things like early mobilisation, early intake of fluids, um, the anaesthetist uses particular cocktail medications that minimises the use of morphine-based uh, meds, so very little use of opiates, all designed to get to, to maximise recovery and get the patient up and moving and restore their physiology as quickly as possible after surgery. I do want to mention a few other bariatric operations that are not commonly performed here because, again, of their rather poor or short-lived efficacy and because of complication rates, but we do see patients back when they've had these abroad. Um, We're seeing huge numbers of patients coming back with balloons in situ um, for early removal of balloons. A gastric balloon is a silicone balloon placed uh, at endoscopy, so via OGD, um, and it's filled with about 700 mils of saline that's stained with methylene blue so that if the balloon bursts or ruptures early, the patient gets uh, blue tinged to their urine and they're supposed to come uh, and have it removed before it travels downstream and can cause a bowel obstruction. Um, it, the reason I think it's the most common procedure people get if they go abroad is the cheapest. So it costs about less than two, two grand in most places, even in the UK, for a, band, a balloon to be put in and removed. Um, it's considered very safe because it doesn't involve any incision. It's uh, endoscopically placed and retrieved. Um, but as soon as it's retrieved, most of the weight that someone has lost with it will go back on. And the weight loss is about 10%. Um, we, it, there is certainly a role for gastric balloons. Um, uh, I certainly see a role for it as a bridge to another procedure. So if somebody is too ill to have a general anaesthetic for a sleeve or a bypass or their BMI is too high to allow a sleeve to be done safely, then a balloon can bridge that gap or actually, you know, I suppose help someone lose an amount of weight to either qualify for another procedure, be that bariatric or, or um, a- another procedure. So there is a role for them, but certainly not as a definitive bariatric or, or weight loss uh, operation. Um, the um, and we've certainly had to remove, We've every week we get patients presenting where they can't tolerate them. Um, they cause really significant nausea, vomiting, and therefore dehydration. And the early explant rate, or the, the, the reason that the amount of people who need them removed early is about 10%. Um, but I actually think the re- the, some of the re- some of the mechanism by which they work is through causing nausea and vomiting. I certainly don't really believe they have a significant uh, impact on hunger. Um, they do make people feel full quickly, but by feeling sick, which is not how the other bariatric operations uh, tend to work. Um, so they're not a pleasant operation. Um, uh, I've included the SADI procedure on the right. This is a more malabsorptive operation than a gastric bypass. It's essentially the, the, the newest way of doing a, a duty switch, an extremely malabsorptive operation, just leaving about 150 centimetres of bowel in circuit uh, for absorption. Um, so if patients have come back, you know, this is something we don't perform it here because we feel the resources needed to follow up a patient afterwards are so intensive that we couldn't really safely provide that. It requires massive input on behalf of the dietitian, psychologist and the patient. So the protein requirements afterwards are, you know, much more so than would be for a gastric bypass. The vitamin requirements requirements are enormous um, because they have to include all fat soluble vitamins and it takes a really motivated patient but we have seen a lot of well a a number of patients who've gone abroad and gotten this with very little preparation and that patient is destined for problems with malnutrition um, afterwards Uh, and um, it's not it's not all reversible because it involves this part part of it involves doing a sleeve gastrectomy and and then a significant intestinal bypass Um, so again it's important to be familiar with it but it's a real red flag if some has gone abroad and had this without follow-up, uh, sorry, without preparation and certainly without follow-up. They need really intensive follow-up afterwards. A gastric plication, we've seen a number of people back with this as well. It's an, intended to mimic a sleeve gastrectomy, but without the complications of a staple line um, and it's cheaper to do. So it involves, instead of stapling the stomach, um, along the greater curve here like we do with the sleeve gastrectomy uh, it's a, it makes it staple lines cost I suppose if you place six of them to staple this that's about a grand if you use you know a thousand euros worth of staples um, if you use your the best quality equipment which uh, which we do and I'm looking at our reps here who are Medtronic so we would use mainly um, Medtronic staples which are the you know really high quality um, uh, and perfectly designed to capture the whole depth of the stomach so in doing so it's expensive you know but 
cost is, is, is well justified because of the good outcomes afterwards. But if you want to eliminate that cost, you could just suture the stomach inwards uh, with a single, a, a, a suture is two euros, if, if even, to do that. So you could suture along it to fold the stomach inwards and do that twice to narrow the lumen uh, to the same, I suppose, capacity as you'd achieve with a sleeve. Um, but it's intended to avoid uh, staple line leaks um, bleeds and achieve the same outcome. It does not do any of that. You can still get leaks at the suture lines um, because the blood supply has been interrupted to this um, part of the stomach, so it can it can leak. Um, and patients feel horribly nauseated because of these folds of um, gastric wall within their lum- with the lumen. So it's also really difficult to undo. To undo both suture lines is, is really difficult. So I've had to undo a few of these recently and, and try and convert them to a sleeve gastrectomy because um, uh, the, the blood supply is interrupted to the to the site because you can't just undo it and leave that part of the stomach that would have no blood supply. Uh, so not a good operation, but cheap. Um, and hence why people choose it when they when they go abroad. So it's easy to sell that to a patient if you're trying to if, if you're commercially driven, um, uh, but uh, not a pleasant operation. And lastly, we've I've, had to, I've seen somebody recently who got this. Uh, device placed in the States and came back with a, a problem at the um, incision site. So this is called a Spiracyst. Happily, happy to know it's just recently gone off the market um, but it's been in, uh, available in the States for the last six or seven years. Um, it's essentially like the reverse of a peg tube. So it's intended for patients to as- aspirate their food, their meal about within 20 minutes of eating. Um, so it leaves a, a button on the stomach that there's a, a tube within the stomach it's connected to um, a patient can just aspirate the meal so they get the pleasure of eating and so it's it's not dissimilar to I, th- I suppose bulimia I hope I'm not minimizing the um uh, or, or being in any way disrespectful to um, the diagnosis of bulimia, but it's inducing essentially that. It's allowing people to save vomiting, but achieving exactly the same thing. A horrible procedure, really surprising, that got FDA approval back in 2015, uh, but the company uh, wound up in uh, June of, the, I think May or June of this year. Um, but a number of people, like I said, there's, uh, there's not an insignificant number of people with these devices in. And when, that's, when that tube is removed, it, I've seen people with wound infections because they have an open hole for from their stomach uh, connected to the skin uh, that weeps for quite a while after the tube has come out. So it's just a breadth of the procedures that are available. Um, it's important to mention who is suitable to have bariatric surgery or who is eligible. Um, because often we find when people have gone abroad for procedures, one of the reasons people go abroad is they couldn't get it here or they're, they're not eligible, but they can still um, get it abroad. It's really, I think it's really important to stick to the rules of, of eligibility for surgery um, without being defensive in your in your practice. It's, it's where surgery is safe. I suppose eligibility criteria, although these are really old, dating back to 1991 and the safety of surgery has improved a lot in the last 30 years. These criteria were arisen from where surgery, where the benefits of surgery outweighed the risks. So elective surgery is very different to emergency surgery where you have no option but to just do it. Where you have a choice here, you have medical interventions, they may not be as good but there's you know, there's very little risk with uh, medications or with diet and lifestyle changes. You have to be certain that the benefits of surgery outweigh the risks of surgery. And they do at this point where BMI is over 40, there's a greater threat to life of obesity and its complications than there is from the operation. And that also holds true for when BMI is 35 and there's an obesity complication such as diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea. In fact, any of the obesity complications associated, um, sorry, any of the, the health problems associated with obesity. But it's also important, we can't just go based on BMI criteria alone. It's really important that patients have tried uh, many other approaches to, to lose weight. Bariatric surgery should never be the first intervention. Like I said, it, it's not a quick fix. Um, so it should never be the first intervention. I certainly don't think we should leave it as long as we probably do in this in, in Ireland um, before recommending it to somebody, but it, it shouldn't be the first thing because of the risk implied. Um, so patients have to have tried before. And when we meet patients for the first time, even if they've tried you know self-directed programs before, they still go through a nine-month program uh, with a multidisciplinary team team guided by professionals um, to get to see if there's any uh, chance that they don't need uh, surgery. There's only been one update to these eligibility criteria in 30 years, and that's um, pertaining to patients with type 2 diabetes uh, and obesity. So it is because of the remission rates you can get with from diabetes with bariatric surgery that those patients benefit at lower BMIs. So even with a BMI over 30, if patients don't have good glycemic control on best medical 
management surgery should be recommended to them uh, because uh, the benefits of cure, cure well putting diabetes into remission we're not I'd use the word cure uh, per the eight American Diabetes Association anymore but we can um, only use the word remission uh, but because of that surgery um, uh, is deemed safe for that population. So surgery is very effective. Before I get into talking about all about complications and the bad stuff that can happen, it's important to highlight all of the benefits, most of which are nothing to do with the weight loss. Many of the benefits of surgery um, are what we call, I suppose, weight independent benefits. Um, and a lot of patients will talk about non-scale victories, um, which are really important to them. We, we celebrate all of this, the, the reductions in medications, the improvements in cardiovascular health, reduction in cancer risk for the most part patients quality of life is, is what's most important to them and, and that's um, significantly improved in over 90 percent of people who have bariatric surgery the weight loss is typically 25 to 30 percent of patients pre-operative weight and um, uh, so that's not all of someone's extra weight it's about two-thirds to three-quarters of it patients will still remain overweight or with uh, a, 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 a with Living, will still live with obesity after bariatric surgery, but the improvement they get in their weight will, will have significant impact on their health. Uh, the most common comp uh, improvements we see are with regards to type 2 diabetes, um, a 40% improvement in cardiovascular uh, health, um, and most patients with obstructive sleep apnea uh, will have a significant improvement or a remission in it, and certainly most patients who've been on CPAP would get off it. And there's massive health savings uh, implied with those health benefits as well. Um, importantly, bariatric surgery lengthens life. So people with obesity have shorter lifespans because of all the health complications. And it can lengthen life by as much as seven to eight years um, for patients when it's done early enough. You lose that benefit once you uh, leave surgery till someone's in their 60s and 70s. But before the age of about 60, you'll, you'll get an, uh, a lengthening of life uh, in patients. And as I said, the most important thing for patients is their quality of life, their function, um, and the non-scale victory that they achieve through, uh, through weight loss and the weight uh, independent um, benefits. So in terms of the safety of surgery, I think as well, before I mention all the complications, it is safe surgery. Um, and I think whenever we're talking about the risks of surgery, it's important to state that this is, although there is a risk, it's considered quite safe surgery. Um, the safety profile is not, in the, certainly in terms of very serious complications, is not dissimilar to that of a cholecystectomy, uh, despite the patient's status, comorbidity status, which would be quite significant. I will talk about both general complications that any patient can experience regardless of what type of operation they've had and then mention some procedure specific complications. So complications can always be divided into early. Early is usually within 30 days of an operation. So what can go wrong within 30 days and then late is after 30 days for life. Um, so the early complications that are uh, generic, so regardless of whether it's a balloon, a sleeve, a bypass or the other operations, the commonest complication is nausea and vomiting. It actually only happens where, to a degree that it causes dehydration in about 1 in 20 to 1 in 25 patients. So it's quite infrequent, but because of the numbers having bariatric surgery, it's what we see the most often. Um, and it becomes really patients, surgery does take away, it takes away patients' thirst and hunger. So if someone isn't prepared to, um, I suppose, almost eat by the clock and drink, you know, consistently throughout the day, it's really easy for them to get dehydrated over the course of one to two weeks. Um, so nausea and vomiting is really important. And that's, I can't stress enough the importance of preoperative education and preparation um, by the dietitians and by clinical nurse specialists like Claire. Um, that's so important to... Um, I would really hammer home to patients the importance of uh, hydrating themselves afterwards because it's the most challenging thing for patients to, to do. Pain is actually quite an insignificant feature once patients leave hospital. It's uh, avoiding dehydration becomes their biggest challenge. The risk of DVT and PE exists for bariatric surgery much more so than other operations because of the um, coexisting obesity. Um, it's, if a patient dies after bariatric surgery, the commonest cause is a PE. So we're so careful to try and prevent it through early mobilisation, through only admitting patients on the day of surgery, through using uh, sequential compression devices during the hospital stay, and we discharge patients home on three weeks of um, low molecular weight heparin or an alternative anticoagulant if patients 
patients already on one. That's so important to try and reduce the risk of PE because as I said it is the commonest cause of mortality and it's almost always av- avoidable when um, you, 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 you're, you anticipate it uh, and address it. Um, you can rescue people from a leak and bleeding but you can't rescue somebody once they have a large PE. There's really nothing you can do except try and stop it getting bigger through anticoagulants. Um, so we try and prevention is key for that. Late complications again generic to all operations will be nutritional deficiencies. That's the commonest one. It happens in between 30 to 50 percent of patients over their lifetime will get a vitamin deficiency. Um, they are preventable through our um, vitamin regimes that we prescribe to patients and that are listed and easily available through BOMS guidance. BOMS is re- has really good guidance for what patients should be on after surgery and it gives procedure specific vitamin recommendations. The commonest things we see would be iron and vitamin D deficiencies. Iron is hard to tolerate after surgery, causes constipation. It's probably the one patients are not as compliant with, um, but it's the most common uh, deficiency, um, therefore, that that we see. The one that's uncommon but really, really serious is thiamine deficiency because we don't often think of it. And in the first six weeks, if someone is vomiting a lot um, and uh, really dehydrated and hasn't been able to tolerate much oral intake, let alone vitamins, the one that we forgot to be really careful to think about is the thiamine deficiency. Uh, We've seen a couple of cases of Wernicke's encephalopathy in patients who've been abroad for surgery and either haven't disclosed that when they come back sick or it hasn't been thought about that they they could have... um, uh, a, a, a thiamine deficiency um, as correctable by giving thiamine Pabernix in the early stages and then oral thiamine three times a day after but it's really important to just consider it in a patient who's had significant vomiting um, and then the common, one of the common things that occurs not as a consequence of sur- surgery itself but via rapid weight loss is gallstones so if we didn't prevent to give uh, there's, a, there's a medication we give to prevent gallstones forming called Urzafoc or Urzodeoxycholic Acid that's supposed to be prescribed for six months after, after surgery if patients have a gallbladder um, that reduces is the risk of stone formation from as high as 20% down to 2%. Um, it's not the easiest medication to tolerate, but it's really important to stress the um, importance of it to patients to try and increase their compliance because otherwise it will lead to another operation within six months to take out uh, someone's gallbladder. Um, and that's the commonest reoperation after bariatric surgery is cholecystectomy. Um, it's not laparoscopy for a leak or bleeding, it's cholecystectomy. And the last thing, patient, patients, it's not an easy cholecystectomy. Within six months, patients still have have a significant obesity and some health complications and they're only a few months after another general anaesthetic so really important if we can avoid it to avoid it and then every obesity is a chronic disease so it's it's not it's impossible to cure it we can't cure it we can treat it well but weight regain is an inevitable risk that patients face and um, the operations are just tools and if patients don't use them uh, well that th- there is a risk and, and that's not to put responsibility all all on the patient it's up to you know us to, to inform them and educate them and guide them in how to use it but there is a risk of weight regain um, highest with the band second highest with the sleeve and probably lowest with the more uh, with the operations like a bypass or a duodenal <laughs> switch Chronic abdominal pain happens in about 1-2% to of patients, that's quite significant, um, regardless of what operation they've had, and that probably pertains to any abdominal surgery someone's had, but it does exist with bariatric surgery, um, and particularly with the gastric bypass, uh, where we always worry about internal hernias, port side hernias, um, uh, but, and, and sometimes we can never find a cause, for a, a, a reason for it, um, and we try and avoid putting people on opiates as much as possible, um, but uh, it, it is a feature of bariatric surgery, just like other operations. And then psychological complications again happen in the latest figures about seven to eight percent um, some of which will pr- be pre- will predate bariatric surgery um, certainly low mood and depression there is a resurgence of that around about two years and perhaps Ruth could correct me on that but um, it can be quite significant there's a risk of transference of addictive behaviors to things like alcohol after surgery in about five to six percent patients as well and that I can't again stress the importance of psychological follow-up as part of the the, the follow-up to um, identify that early and, and intervene if there is any uh, evidence of it. So pr- uh, procedure specific, before I get on to talking about tourism, procedure specific complications to be aware of. If patients have a gastric band, the things that can happen to it are it can move on the stomach, causing obstruction, so-called a band slip. That can be quite minor and cause significant reflux and just intermittent vomiting, but it can be significant enough if it's quite sudden or, or quite a, a a big slip on the stomach to cause complete obstruction and inability to swallow even saliva, in which case that's urgent and they need to come and have it removed uh, uh, you know, within hours.
hours. Um, ever, if ever a patient has a gastric band and they come with vomiting and pain, pain is ominous. Uh, if they have pain with a band slip, it means the blood supply is interrupted to the stomach. There's a, the pain is indicative of some type of ischemia usually. Uh, so that's worrisome. So pain and a gastric band, it should always come to an ED uh, quickly. Bands erode into the stomach and often with the gastric bands, this tubing here is connected to a little port under the skin that you can't see. You could feel it and patients should know where it is. But if ever that port site is red or inflamed, that's often an indication that the band has eroded into the stomach. Um, that's actually not that urgent. You know, it's probably happened over months uh, that it's actually behaved like a seat on it and eroded all the way into the stomach. Patients will feel like their band is gone. They have no sense of restriction anymore because it's not around the stomach, it's within it. But the commonest thing they get is port site infection so just inflammation soreness and sometimes the band port will even protrude onto the skin and you'll see the metal uh, or the, the plastic part of it um, so I would like to we need to see that person quickly but it's not uh, the, I wouldn't take them to theatre overnight for example to remove it they're quite difficult to remove uh, when they're in the stomach they um, uh, often need a laparotomy open the stomach retrieve it it's a big deal uh, but not urgent so you can plan it um, uh, less serious but quite significant for the patient in terms of their function is it can cause significant reflux and even dysmotility of the stomach that is not always reversible when the band is gone. So message is bands are bad. <laughs> from Certainly I, I personally think the bands for the most part have more complications than benefits. Um, but on, unlike the sleeve and bypass complications are rare, particularly serious ones like leak and bleeding. They're one in a hundred risk of that um, and they would typically happen before somebody leaves hospital. It'd be very rare that somebody would be home and get sick, you know, at six weeks, they're not going to have a leak or a bleed. Um, so they're, you know, they're typically early, very early complications. What can happen later is the sleeve can start to twist or spiral because it's not anchored down on this lateral side anymore. Um, and that can persist with, uh, present with persistent nausea and, and vomiting. Um, and sometimes that needs reoperation to a gastric bypass to fix it. With a gastric bypass, the complications that can occur, again, leak or bleeding, a one in a hundred risk of that, but about a four to five percent risk of getting an ulcer, particularly if patients resume smoking and if they take anti-inflammatories. This area here, the join up between the stomach and the bowel is really vulnerable to ulceration um, uh, and uh, the, the offenders are usually smoking or NSAIDs. Even topical NSAIDs should be a no-no for patients who've had a gastric bypass because there is systemic absorption and unfortunately this area here is so vulnerable to ulcer and it can be really hard. To, it's, it's both painful, um, but it can lead to perforation, uh, a chronic ulcer. Um, so we try and always remind patients afterwards uh, when they may long have forgotten they've had a bypass to avoid NSAIDs as, as a lifelong rule. Um, probably even three days of NSAIDs consecutively would be enough to trigger, to, to cause an ulcer. Um, internal hernia is a risk after any intestinal surgery, including gastric bypass. There's a lot we do during the surgery to try and prevent it, uh, but there's a one in a hundred risk of a significant internal hernia causing bowel ischemia. So if ever a patient who's at a gastric bypass presents and they have severe abdominal pain, it's sudden onset, usually associated with vomiting, they need to come to an ED very quickly to, uh, on the suspicion they could have an internal hernia. Um, it will be really severe pain. It's ischemic pain, so it's out of proportion to what you see and what you ex can feel on examination. Um, and they're usually like crippled over it's intolerable so that person absolutely needs to come to an ED and bowel obstruction again it's un really uncommon can happen from any kind of adhesion but patient with persistent vomiting that person needs to come to an ED uh, as well and the balloons again nausea and vomiting is a common complication but they can cause pressure ulceration or even perforation um, and certainly if they burst and migrate downstream they can cause obstruction and perforation of the bowel as well so Getting on to the last part of the talk, just for the next five minutes, I want to show you what the problem is with bariatric tourism here. We're absolutely inundated with problems and really, I suppose, um, uh, our service is under strain anyway, trying to manage our elective workload with very few people. Um, and this has put a massive strain on it that we need every, you know, certainly we need GPs help in managing it as much as possible um, and community dietitians as well. Um, to, 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 and I need to ask you for answers more. I, I don't have all the answers on how we manage this. 
but I want to bring it up with you. This was highlighted over the last few months in the media um, and it really bothers me that um, I think the narrative around this is really important to control because it can give the message that bariatric surgery is unsafe, which it is not when it's done in a centre like here where there's an MDT managing the patient um, and when patients are prepared and followed up. But when that approach isn't followed, yes, it, it can be it can be unsafe. Um, so words like botched and flawed operations are, you know, are, they're, um, they, they, I, I, I really worry about them and the message that can have for bariatric surgery um, uh, as a whole. But it is, a, it is a big problem for us. And the reason people go abroad for surgery um, is the same as why other, we're not the only country that has this problem. In the UK as well, where this paper uh, looked at you know, a huge number of patients that went abroad for surgery and got the reasons they went abroad. It's because of long waiting lists and um, patients can't get surgery in a timely manner in their home country. And that certainly is relevant here as well. Our waiting list is somewhere between about four and six years at the moment from time of referral to surgery. Um, and we're unsure as to when people go abroad and they come back with problems. The vast majority are not on our waiting list. I think they just know the waiting lists are long and make a decision not to go, not to wait. Um, but the high cost in the if patients don't have insurance that would cover their surgery otherwise, then the high cost in the private sector in Ireland uh, is what's encouraging people to go abroad because they can get it for a fraction of the price, about a quarter of the price. Um, there is about 20% of people who will go abroad because they couldn't get surgery at home and they don't meet the criteria. The criteria I mentioned earlier, they don't meet them. Their BMI isn't high enough, but they can still get surgery abroad. Um, and some people, about 2%, want to avoid the MDT workup, the psychological evaluation in particular, which is a real red flag. Um, uh, and then the other, I suppose, uh, they're the reasons people go abroad. The main concerns I and, and the whole team have about um, bariatric tourism is that there really is no patient selection process, you know, not, really none. Um, there's a t there's token kind of effort to put eligibility criteria on websites, but they're not followed for the most part. We've had people back who've gone abroad and gotten surgery with normal BMIs um, so, and people who have a lot of medical complications who might have precluded having surgery safely even in here um, and that, that hasn't been adhered to. There's little to no pre-operative education uh, or preparation um, there's no MDT decision, there's no MDT process really, and certainly no MDT meeting about patients. Um, and there's little to no follow-up. Most clinics, three quarters, recommend just follow-up in the country of origin to be arranged by the patient themselves. Tell them to go back to their GP and follow up with their GP without involving the GP or even getting a GP name. So if you Google bariatric surgery here, just put that into Google, the first thing that comes up is all these ads, like patients are inundated with ads for, for going abroad. Um, and as soon as you start to look this up, all your social media, as, as I have done in the last few weeks, uh, becomes targets you with ads for it. You know, it's, it's really, um, uh, really targeted uh, at people who, who might be, I suppose, vulnerable, uh, or if you've shown any interest in it at all. Um, so, the, I mean, the cost of surgeries abroad is really enticing. It's such a low cost overall when patients are aware of what it could cost here. Um, these are, even if you go for the most expensive options, which is probably Belgium or the UK, surgery can be achieved for as little as, I suppose, 6,000. And when we operate on patients here, and, it, you know, even at, when you do, the more you do, the cheaper it gets uh, for the most part. But it's about 10,000 per operation when you do it in the uh, for, in, with an MDT approach. Um, and that includes uh, pre Ed, uh, education, preparation, the operation, and follow up as well. Um, so, if you're like, as soon as I put that in, I, I started clicking on some of these to see what information is in it. They were calling a sleeve tube stomach surgery. I mean, it's the lack of professionalism around all these websites is it, it, it really frightened me. But there's so much information there. Um, there's YouTube channels, you know, with patient testimonials on how amazing everything was. Um, you know, it's, it's really if you were looking for a reason to go, or if you were anyway interested, you could find enough positive things said about the processes to um, encourage you to make that step. Um, you know, when I clicked on Belgium, I suppose being the most extensive, I did click on this and I went to inquire uh, two nights ago to see how easy I suppose tried to do a secret shopper thing to see how far could I get uh, in terms of um, getting myself an operation if I wanted one. Um, so this is what I got back this morning, actually, just <laughs> 12 hours after um, having just had to put in name. And I think it's the only time I've ever used my married name uh, to try and in some way disguise, uh, um, you know, who I was to see what I could get back. But got this very generic and what worried me the most is this so you had to answer this a, a questionnaire that was attached that I assumed would be really lengthy really detailed and get all medical information and um, surgical information before 
And it was just once I complete the questionnaire, don't have to come for consultation. That was all the information they needed. So it's just so easy to get surgery abroad without any, you know, uh, detailed preoperative process. This was the questionnaire. Um, I couldn't believe it. it. Literally, there was no request for medical information, just previous operations. Um, so no, no, um, uh, you know, had I diabetes, had I hypertension, were they controlled, were they managed? Nothing. So patients fill this and they rock up for surgery the day before they're expected to have it and they're going if they're able to pay for an operation really are going to get it. I'm going to follow through on this and send it back and and see yeah, how far I get but it's really alarming how easy it is to get surgery um yeah and you get one person gets it free and they get discounts on their next operation um, you can add in operations so you can add in to get your teeth done you can add in to get uh, rhinoplasty um, if doing all what I, what I did last it was, did not take long but if that's too much you can actually go on a broker site like treatmentabroad.com uh, and it will select the best price for you so it'll give you all your options um, If you, like you said there you can say just me or if, you're, if four or five people want to go there'll be discounts applied um, um, so really, really harmful practices. And as I said, here you can get surgery for as low as 3000 for a sleeve gastrectomy, and it'll give you the prices, um, including travel and accommodation across all, all countries around Europe. So it's really easy for patients to, to avail of this. So we've looked over the past 18 months or so at the impact of emergency presentations on Vincent's, and I'm conscious that it's so hard to quantify the burden on outpatient services here, which is way more than the data I'm going to present. And it's a piece of work we need to do as a team to quantify it. So we're not resourced for it. We're not reimbursed for it in any way. It's just a cost and more troublesome than our own patients who we know, we know them, we know what operation they've had, you know, and we can manage, manage our own complications. And there are some, that's enough, that, that's onerous enough and all this on top of it is just absolutely unmanageable at the moment. So we looked at the period, there seems to be um, and it, it was anecdotal initially, it just seemed like pa patients since COVID, since the first lockdown, the volumes of people coming through the ED with complications was just enormous, it was more frequent, so um, put some evidence to that and there has been a near threefold increase in presentations back uh, certainly to Vincent's, which is where the most, most of them would uh, be referred since February 2020, so at the beginning, say from, if we take COVID as a, a as a line, and look at 18 months before and 18 months after, um, there's been a th near threefold increase. So we used to get a trickle of maybe two or three cases a month back with a complication, and now it's every two to three days, or sometimes two people a night. Uh, and certainly, even since November of last year, I, 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 um, I hate to say, but it's increased even further. Where almost every morning we have to ask from the other surgical teams, did any anybody come in overnight? And the answer is almost always yes. They're not all very, very sick, but um, they are they are presenting very frequently. And it's not a problem unique to Vincent's anymore. Patients are presenting to James's, the Matter, Beaumont, to any upper GI service, any surgical service. And as I said, this all excludes outpatient work, which is another burden of less acute work, but completely separate as well. Um, most of them are women. Um, so it's particularly the, the, peop the social media sites and the, t the tourism uh, brokers are targeting young females through social media. So you can see even in the last 18 months, the age of patients going abroad has decreased and, and you know, even girls as young as their early 20s are going abroad in, you know, bus full, buses collect people from, uh, certainly, you know, there's a bus that goes from Bray once a week um, with about 20, 22 girls on it, uh, usually, and a chartered flight to, to clinics in Turkey. Um, and there's a, another one from Malahide uh, somewhere um, every week as well. Um, so there's there's no shortage of patients, and I'm also conscious we do not know the denominator. We have no idea of what the denominator is. So of the 106 patients that came back through the emergency department in the last 18 months or so, we have no idea if that's one in a hundred people who've gone abroad. That's really scary if it is, because uh, that means you know there's ten, you know potentially thousands of people going abroad um, in that time period. So what are they coming back? You know, I suppose we looked at the pand. What was really worrisome is even despite the strict travel lockdowns, 44% um, of patients who've come back had had their surgery very recently. We still get a lot of patients back with bands which have been placed 10 years ago or 5 years ago but a lot for almost half the patients who presented in the last 18 months had gone abroad very recently or in during the lockdown and particularly to patients that were not, it was not in any way approved 
uh, the places they, via the traffic light system that was in place at the time. And many patients presented back early within their quarantine period when that was a thing back last year. Um, and that was a huge burden to the hospital. They had to be placed in COVID rooms. Uh, some of them came back with COVID as well, which further complicated their, their post-operative course. Um, the operations they get the most often is still the sleeve gastrectomy, over half the patients, 53%. But it was the whole range of operations I've mentioned, the band, bypass, balloon. And there's a significant, there's the 3% of people had no idea what operation they'd had. They really couldn't. And so there's a piece of work for us to do then in trying to figure it out. Usually it's easy to figure it out on a CT scan, but you have to start, you have no idea where to start other than scan or scope patients to find out what they've had. And there was a, a number of patients who'd had a number of procedures done. Um, rhinoplasty was one and abdominoplasty or breast implants were the other as well. Where are they going? It is most commonly Turkey, 60%. But, you know, across across Europe, um, uh, is you know, there's, there's any number of clinics, but Turkey seems to be the biggest... Uh, the biggest problem. Um, Pre-pandemic, it was pretty similar actually, but there was a more. It was more common for people to go to the UK, um, and we, we weren't as I suppose focused on on getting the information. So some of the charts that we looked at, actually, the destination wasn't wasn't identified. Um, for the time, where slip gastric band is still the commonest complication coming back, um, uh, followed by persistent pain. Sometimes the pain is within normal limits, but patients didn't know what to expect. Um, but you always have to investigate it to rule something like an abscess, um, a hematoma, or a bowel obstruction or hernia. So there's a burden of work it places for us to know whether it's something that needs intervention or not. Um, but pers and persistent nausea and vomiting would be the third commonest reason people uh, would pres present. There is an increase in the complexity of patient that's returning in the last 18 months compared to before so um, and it's it's uh, pr placing a greater burden of care on, on us to manage them so previously if you look at all the bed days used in the 18 months pre-COVID that's gone up nearly fivefold uh, because of the complexity of the complications returning back and the types of treatment they need vary from not all patients need a re-operation only about a quarter of patients do um, uh, but often patients, they'll still need to be heavily investigated, usually with CT scan, endoscopy and a barium or a gastrograph and swallow study. So they consume enormous amount of resources. And the cost of this to certainly just, just to Vincent's in the last 18 months is about a million. Uh, and prior to that, it's, uh, it was under a quarter of a million. So the cost has gone up fourfold of managing. And again, that's, there's no money. We're not reimbursed for this, um, uh, either in terms financially or in terms of people to, to manage it. Um, so how can we prevent it. Um, again, here's where I have more questions. I don't have the answers, and perhaps he might, you know, it's something I think we need to do as a team to come up and be part and lead on managing it, uh, so that we don't send a message that bariatric surgery is unsafe. That's really important. We don't damage the reputation of bariatric surgery um, because it can be so beneficial for most patients when it's provided in a, a carefully planned um, uh, uh, way with a multidisciplinary team supporting the patient. But I certainly think we'd go a long way to preventing bariatric tourism if we had a more accessible service in Ireland. I think expand, rolling out the model of care and um, expanding access to surgery across the country will lead to, and uh, that will decrease the waiting list so people will be less inclined and feel less need to go away if they can get surgery safely in Ireland. Prevention is obviously key. I think we, we've missed that boat for patients who have severe obesity and, and complications from it. But again, we need to keep putting resources into preventing obesity, particularly for children and adolescents. And I think we, you know, the, the most important thing to do, um, and again, how we do this is, is, is questionable, but we do need to educate the public on the risks of traveling abroad for surgery and how surgery should be well performed. Um, you know, I think we should be encouraging patients considering it to, to talk to G, their GPs first and foremost um, and I suppose then it's up to GP, I hate to put the burden on GPs but it's up to them to have a discussion that this potentially is not the safest thing for them and to direct them to our service um, to be assessed and put on a, a waiting list or to the newer services that will develop in the country in the next few years whether we, we've always shied away from using social media, we don't use it in our service, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should get a professional, like use um, or develop our own uh, internet resources and social media pages so we can put out quality information and control the narrative around it. I think we probably can't shy away from that anymore, you know, and, and uh, I, I suppose warn people about the, uh, rather than put out warnings, maybe to say how it should be done well uh, and let that be where we start um, and let people decide then 
if they want to stray from that or, or not. But I think that's probably one of that. That's where patients are being targeted. So I think that's where we should put quality information. But in summary, I just want to, hi- I suppose, highlight that bariatric surgery is a very effective treatment. I feel I've talked all, you know, all about the bad things that can happen, but it is a really effective treatment. It is a very safe operation, but only when it's performed in carefully selected and well prepared patients. Um, but it's still even then and even in our own patients, it's really important that they are aware and accepting of the risks of surgery, both early and late, um, and that they're prepared for them. Um, but uh, obviously bariatric tourism is a significant problem for all of us um, it's placing a huge burden on us on our resources, you know, personnel and financially um, and I think we need to be lead on, on addressing it in ways that, are, but I'd welcome your input as to how you think we should do that in a sensitive manner but a way that protects the, the service um, without scaremongering people as well Thank you Sorry, I went on for way too long. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. From a health economics perspective, you said a six year waiting list. Is there a measurable cost associated with not performing the surgery? Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. We, we've looked at that in the last few years by looking to see what um, what health problems, what's happened while people are waiting on the on our waiting list. So when we last looked at it, there were over over a dozen deaths on our waiting list, variety of different reasons, and they're not all preventable. They highlight the threat of obesity to life, um, but there were deaths on our waiting list, which is the biggest cost to society of all is premature mortality. Um, secondly, fifth, actually people. People don't necessarily get heavier on the waiting list, but they get sicker. So we, there was an increase in the comorbidity burden and therefore the cost of that to the healthcare service. So patients are costing money to the service while they're waiting and an operation could potentially have started saving money on medications and improving health far before that. But unfortunately, that requires a long term view to convince the government to kind of, I suppose, um, uh, look at the cost benefit of bariatric surgery. It's probably one of the very few cost effective interventions that exist you know most operations and medicines just cost money and there's no real return in your investment with bariatric surgery there is for exactly that reason patients cost money while they have uh, while they live with obesity and its complications and with private insurers obviously they're pushing more towards preventative uh, for those same reasons of a lifetime of medications, etc. Yeah, it's, it's in, the insurance thing is interesting because when trying to get the insurance insurers cover it, they don't um, they, they they have a higher threshold for BMI eligibility. It's five above what NIH and ours is to try and limit a, a, a access to surgery. Um, but you see, they because patients, for example, type two diabetes, the insurers don't care about diabetes remission because they don't pay for diabetes treatments. So really, they only care about the number as a joints you're going to save needing to be replaced. Um, they do pay for cancer care a lot, so saving a, so the narrative to them to get them to fund more of it is, has to be slightly different. But, you know, it's it depends on who you're talking to as to what message you're trying to get across. It should you know it shouldn't be that way. It should be that they just see the, the overall benefits. But um, unfortunately the payer, whoever's paying for it, really only cares about what the cost is to them and that and that's different depending on whether it's a public or, or a private payer. Yeah, I think there'll always be a role for surgery. I suppose that there's still limits to oh, that. That's the holy grail. I suppose is that this will be the peptic ulcer surgery of you know the 70s and 80s, where it just we don't you know I've never seen a highly selective agotomy because PPIs uh, have completely eliminated the need for surgical solutions to peptic ulcers. Um, so will this be you know in 50 years time? Will we still because medications will be so? I you know I suppose. Um, 
like uh, some people argue that medicines will only increase the need for surgery because people will realize what mm. benefits they get from losing weight and the health benefits of those drugs, which are very similar to what you can achieve from surgery. Um, uh, you know, it gives people, uh, I suppose, uh, an insight into what it's like to live with a lesser degree of obesity and less health complications from it. And they might want more. They can realize that surgery can be more effective than medicines on their own um, and maybe eliminate the need for, for lifelong medications, which are very costly. So, you know, it's, th- there'll always be, I think, a role for surgery, um, but it might, c- might become less. And I certainly think in the future, it might be combining therapies will probably give patients the best results in the long term, you know. But That's definitely the way that we're moving, actually, mm-hmm. because we're seeing that they're really synergistic. So we've seen people who haven't responded as well to the medications have the surgery, then start regaining weight, then we add in the medication and they do better overall. So it sort of comes together. Probably the way it's going to be. Yeah. Is there a cross border initiative or like any recognised centres that the HSC will reimburse or? really good question. I, I don't actually understand that the treatment abroad scheme, I suppose the, um, is uh, like it, it, bariatric surgery is one of the operations that patients can get abroad and it's listed as one of the ones that can be reimbursed. Um, I've, I've personally never, I've known one person who's managed to get reimbursed some of the money that they spent um, uh, they often ask us for a referral to uh, a- another centre and I'll never write that letter. For, that sounds terrible, but I find it's really hard to, I don't know of any, um, I would find it hard to take the responsibility to send someone to any of these clinics abroad when you can't, there's no easy way for any healthcare professional to validate another centre so that you'd be happy to recommend your own patient to go there, um, you know, the, to a team you don't know, you don't know the quality of, it, you don't know the volume so I find it really hard to um, send patients down that route and if patients go down it I, I, you know it is available but it's really it's to me it seems really hard to access it because but I, I think that's intentional <laughs> to save money it's it's um, out there has been one of the operations that patients can get money back on but it's just really hard to you know I, and we should I don't think we should have to have to look for that there's no service in Northern Ireland certainly unlike hips and knees and cataracts and um, there is no bariatric service in the north public or private so cross our own border isn't an option um, and there's a lot of rules around that the cross-border and treatment abroad scheme with regards to having it, it to be in a public or institution and you know that uh, it's so complex like I said it's um, hard for us to navigate let alone patients sorry just on the private health insurance again you're saying the criteria they to say that the BMI is at 5 so 45 is 45 it? Yeah, actually, uh, in the last few months, VHI have come back down to NIH eligibility. And usually then it seems to me that the other insurers follow, but the others are still 45 and and 40 with a complication other than just in the last few weeks, actually, VHI have come in line with what is the internationally uh, recognised eligibility criteria. I I don't know if many people are aware of that. I think maybe with that help with the tourism side of things, but I know obviously then... Mm-hmm. Maybe, I suppose, I feel a huge, I, I'd never say it to patients because there's such a conflict, you know, um, I think there's a huge conflict. Why would you say it in Ireland? Yeah. yeah I don't know no, but it, it is available for patients. Try to be here and, and get it reimbursed. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly an option for the amount of people that have, um, and there's still, even if it's covered, I still think there's an out-of-pocket fee that's like on follow-up visits so the insurers cover mostly the surgical episode but it's still costly to patients for the assessments and there's a decline in follow-up for sure when patients have to pay per visit to see you know be that the surgeon the the endocrinologist the dietitian and they're far less likely to do so it's a great option for patients to have they can get some money back on their fall on their um and we certainly we have a service in vincent's private and it's you know it's not like it's about an 18 month wait to get through that, um, a lot of which is necessary to get through the, the pre-operative um, preparation, uh, but there's still a long waiting list for it. But it is certainly a good, it's a good option. It's better than going, certainly better than going abroad. Chair. Can I just make a comment on the cross-border um, initiative? So the fact that our waiting list is for a level three bariatric service, a lot of patients would bring us who are on that waiting list or, or people from the cross-border initiative would bring us and say, 
is such and such a patient on your waiting list, but you're not on a waiting list for bariatric surgery. Yeah. They haven't been assessed by our team, they haven't seen the surgeon, they have so they're not on a waiting list for surgery. And that is the problem. So I don't know if those patients are getting reimbursed, I would say they're not, because they're not on a waiting on list. A waiting list yeah. They're only for a level three service. Because the interesting thing, once actually patients get on our surgery waiting list after going to the biggest wait at the moment is from referral to initiating the for our new patient visit, um, the first entry point into the service. Once they get through, they're not like that has come down from what was probably three to four years to about a year now, isn't it? Claire? Like to just under two. So that is getting better. It's just we need more people to, um, and not if the last person you need is more surgeons. You need more people. Um, uh, to, uh, uh, the, the whole team needs to be expanded on. You probably need for every surgeon there is, you need twice the number of healthcare like dietitians, psychologists, uh, and physicians to to follow up the patients. The greatest fo- onus in terms of follow up is, pro- is on dietitians um, and nurses and psychology. Um, uh, not underestimating the work the physicians do but it is the biggest burden like is certainly I think with the dietitians who manage a lot of the technique changes in terms of eating um, and uh, and of course physio as well <laughs> but um, it's uh, the surgeon has the least important role honestly in the whole process um, which is it's an easy thing for us to say it's uh, surgery is but a bit in the middle um, the most important thing about the, the, the process is preparation and then follow up um, and preparation I'd argue is more important than the and follow up um, uh, if you were to prioritise one over another um, but uh, you know the surgery is actually the easy bit the, the, the operation itself um, once patients are home from that you kind of don't the, the, that's when you know sometimes for most patients the real work begins um, and most of the challenges they face are not anything the surgeon can fix it's usually dietetics first psychology probably you know at the sa- same level of um, demand for, for psychological uh, input and then physicians in terms of change in medications and surgeons if there's problems um, like we all have a role but it's, it's, not, it's, it's predominantly on the dietitians Thanks so much